Okay. This is this is a little bit different, and I'll give you a little quick bit of the history, and then tell you why um, uh, when I gave it a couple of times, um, they said, you know, th this would be great for small businesses to actually see. Um, the history of this, I'll flip to my flip to my next one. Uh, okay. Um, this came out of uh, uh, about oh, about six years ago. Um, I had the uh, vendor management office out of the IT directorate. And one of the things I wanted to do was to uh, dig into the um, some of the contracting problems that I had seen. I chaired a couple of boards. I was on another board. And... Um, I had dealt with a lot of the the issues that came out of contracts, and everybody was complaining about them. That's generally the uh, contracting officers, but a lot of the technical folks did too. And so I just decided to uh, do a benchmarking. I worked with uh, I think five NASA centers and Mars and ourselves, and uh, the whole idea was to. Uh, determine what are these problems that are systemic. They always they always kick themselves. You know they're always there, and um, sometimes a little, sometimes a lot, but they seem to be pretty routine. And talk with the uh, uh, procurement folks and the technical folks, and identify them, and then come up and find out if anybody actually try to do some things in the contract to make them work. Now, how this how this relates to you is the fact that in um, in the contracting officers complaining and the technical people complaining um, and actually coming up with some the things some of the things that work, um, I'm through this through this presentation, uh, we're going to kind of show you uh, what are the things that they complain about, which you'll never hear about. You, know, you you'll never hear them. Um, I don't care where you, where you go; uh, it's always kind of kept kept quiet. Um, and you'll also find out how they think, and the fact that the technical people and the contracting officers for these contracts um, absolutely are at opposite ends of the spectrum. Um, they are not they are not best buddies and friends. Uh, they both have objectives that they want to meet. And by getting them all together, though, we were able to isolate the uh, number of uh, problems. So um, we did that and it turned out they were all business problems. Every single one of them. None of them turned out to be a technical problem, uh, but they were all somewhere in managing the contract. So just going down here. Okay, these are what they came up with. And uh, surprisingly, um, every single one of these, uh, there was at least one center that had come up with a way to deal with it, or the contracting officer said the only way you can ever fix this is to do it but if you if you don't then there's going to be a problem so the reason i'm kind of telling you this is one you'll kind of understand how they think um, what the problems are that they see that pop out and most of the time it's how they put the contract together or how they manage the contract um, but if there were things that were put into the contract differently um, it, it definitely would help why I think this is important for everyone uh, to see in the small business community and the, and the large primes, it, it, it goes for the large primes too, is, um, is the fact that as you go into your proposals, as you meet with the contracting officers and the board chairs uh, prior to the draft RFP coming out, there's a, a lot of the time you can um, tell them how some of the things that 
you've seen or problems or it, when you ask the contracting officer, are there problems that you deal with? Um, you'll actually have um, answers to put in your proposals, which will make you look like a lot better contractor. And the reason I say that is the last one that I chaired, uh, we had, I think, five or six um, uh, companies that put proposals in. And two of those companies um, actually, in their proposals, told us that, hey, you know, there are problems with this type of thing, or this is how we are going to handle this type of problem. And so they basically said there is a problem. You know, typically there can be a problem with this. Here is how we would handle it. Though one of those two won, and both of them impressed everyone on the board. So let me go through those. Okay. Uh, okay, innovation. And I'm not going to read all of this. Uh, you can go ahead and read. I'll sort of just give you the, the general scope because there's way too many to go through anyway. Um, in contracts, um, typically the uh, technical people want to have in the contract that if you come up with a really good idea and it's a big idea, we are going to reward you in the end um, in the award fee or somewhere along the line, there's, there's going to be a financial uh, reward. And so what typically happens is they put this in, they say, look, if you've got it, we will give you 25% or 50% of the dollars that you save on this big project. The problem is um, you, you didn't propose um, with enough extra you know, extra in there uh, that you can put a lot of resources to any big project. And typically, and this, and this was across the board with all six NASA centers, typically they never actually end up happening because it takes too much time. Um, in this case, the, the NASA folks would be in there and that's not really the way they wanted it. So they want you to do something different. <clears throat> and so in the end, it never happens, <coughs> but you've had to uh, expend resources to try to make it happen. So that was really a that was really a big problem. So I think it was Langley that came up and they said, you know, we've dealt with this for years. Here's how we chose to solve it, and it worked. And what they did was they said, okay. Uh, we need to see five or six very small improvements. Um, it could be a different way of, of working customer service. It could be a, a different way of actually ordering uh, goods, maybe from different centers and that type of thing. Um, in some cases, it was just um, how the workflow uh, was being managed. They were very small, didn't cost a lot, and... What they would do, because all contracts or all large contracts have, an, have in there uh, for a way to um, uh, help the folks if they come up with some good ideas and that type of thing. There's always a way to reward them, take them out to dinner, that type of thing. Um, what they did was they said, um, we're going to have a suggestion plan. And in that suggestion plan, um, we want you to come up with, you know, we're going to, we would come up with uh, five or six things, and they had to, to get an excellent, they actually had to do this five or six small things. And so they had, they had the people, um, the employees actually come up with the suggestions. They would pick the good ones, uh, and they would pick five or six good ones, and they would get a dinner for two or some other financial reward. Some of them got a, you know, a, a uh, Starbucks card or something like that. Very low cost, easy to do, and always, uh, and it was very effective. <clears throat> so I, I, I have to kind of switch it this way. If, if they come up with um, a way to do process improvements, and every contract, large, you know, even medium-sized contracts, will always have something in there, and they want to see how you're going to do it. 
this is a good one because it works. It's very low cost and um, it's it's really good for, you know, for the morale. And so they said that they have done it on six or seven of their contracts. And they said every time it was done this way, it was a big plus. It made and it made the contractor look good because they were successfully doing it. I say this because if you are proposing on something and this comes up, this is a very good way to look good. And if they actually put in something where it's a, a big project or something like that, um, you can talk to the CO. You can try to get it so that is it all right if we come up with our own idea and you put that in? And the technical people liked it and the contracting officers liked it. So next one. Innovation. And in here, there's a lot of discussion on some other small ways of doing it. I left those in there for you to take a look at if you want to. And some may fit better than the one that I just told you. Project management is a way to get the contractor to step up to doing, and remember, this is how they think. This is how they used to talk in the boards. It's a way to get the contractor to step up to doing project management projects without the government doing a significant portion of the work. And in some contracts, you had um, the, the management team really had it together and there was never a problem. In other ones, they weren't used to doing a lot of projects and so they would just throw somebody on it it wasn't uh, it wasn't well structured and the board never really told them exactly what they were expecting they were just going to get a lot of projects and so um the to address this there were really two key things if that was really critical, there were two things that they said you need to do every time. Have a DRD for project management, have a project manager as a key personnel position. Now, if this came up um, and that you're gonna be doing a lot of projects and they don't talk about, they really don't give you a lot of direction, the best way to do this is to flip it around and say, here's how we're going to do the projects. You can't create a DRD for them, but you can um, give them a structure and you can't say it's a key personnel position, but to be honest with you, you can, you actually could say, we feel that uh, these projects need to be handled properly. We've actually gonna put a project manager or a part-time project manager if there isn't that much work and we are going to we're going to use them as a key personnel position and they will be on our management team not just someone from there so what you're really doing is you're flipping it around and you're saying here's how we plan to handle this problem and you never tell them that you know any of this came from somewhere else uh project management project management uh outsourcing Outsourcing was often, um, except in the largest, large contracts, and we always had small businesses do our, uh, do our work. We always had at least two or three small businesses, and all that you're seeing here, um, you know, was involved with our projects. And so with outsourcing, uh, what would happen is if there was something that was, that was unique, they did not have the skills. And it was a project that, to be honest with you, the contract really didn't, it, it may have been in the statement of work, but it was a really small part. So they really didn't staff for it. And all of a sudden they have a project or they have a problem that has to be solved. And so we would know, you know, the contractor is doing a good job, but they do not have uh, this skill. And so we would talk to them and say, hey, why don't you go ahead and, um, you know, outsource it. We're going to pay for it and uh, go ahead and outsource it. 90% of the time, the contractor was just trying to um, get through it. And so they would throw people on it who really weren't qualified. 
and they tried to to just they just really tried to kind of muffle their way through it. And so best way to handle that is to talk about how you plan to do outsourcing, when you plan to do outsourcing, and the fact that you're going to you will uh, discuss that with the contracting officer if a project comes up. So what you're really doing is you're turning it around and you're telling them, hey, here's how we handle difficult situations and you put it in the proposal. They will see that as a mature and a really good contractor. And I can't emphasize that enough. Every one of these things, if you flip it around and say, you know, in such and such a situation, um, there, there's always a risk of this happening and this is how we will take care of it. And that's the difference between a very weak proposal and a strong proposal. So moving on, so I don't take too much time here, outsourcing, outsourcing. Uh, this one, uh, this one gets complained about a lot and usually by the technical folks <clears throat> and um, the technical folks and I guess the contracting officer too. Misuse of CLCs are the contract labor categories. Um, when you have uh, um, in any contract, the government has already done uh, a government estimate. They figured out how many of uh, a certain labor category, high, low, medium, and they have they have stuck them in there. And so they have a pretty fair idea of the labor categories that need to be used. And most people pretty much follow that. Well, one of the things, um, one of the things that irritates the contracting officer right off the bat is the fact you've had people there for a long time and we had a contract that had been in place for 35 years and in those 35 years only a handful of people had left i think 30 percent of the people had actually left over that time period so they were all at the high end of their categories and so um, in doing that uh, the government realize because we would always tell them hey we want you to keep most of your staff and everything to keep continuity well what you were also doing is you were keeping the uh, high labor categories in place which really escalated the costs and in many cases it was really unskilled work but to keep the people they just kept lift you know kept raising those up so um one of the things um knowing that they've already done their own estimate, you see in the draft RFP what those labor categories are that they think should be in place. Um, what you need to do is to, uh, you're going to, you know, if it's a new contract, you're just going to hire people and you will stick them in at that, those uh, labor categories. What ends up happening throughout the contract is you want to keep those people, even though it may be unskilled work, they, they're there, um, you start um, increasing the labor categories. And in many cases, the CEO doesn't even know you did it and their costs, the costs start to escalate. And that's a real pet peeve with them. So the way that if I were doing it, the way I would handle it is in the proposal, you would indicate that um, you will only increase labor categories if the person has matured and they really should get that higher labor category. But the most important part is that you will always work with the contracting officer and let them know what you're doing and get their buy-in. And I know that when it comes to award fees and things of that nature, um, that's one thing that um, helps you is that you stay in touch with the CO and whenever you're increasing those labor categories, uh, you stay in touch with them. And I would put that right in the proposal, how you actually want to do that. Uh, next one, misuse, these are all the misuse. And let's see, oh, let's just go to the vendor management. We're only halfway through. 
Vendor management. And this one um, actually comes up a lot more in contracts than it did back in the 90s when I had started at NASA. Is there a way for the contractor to perform strategic sourcing? And of course, strategic sourcing, and I've got the definition there where you continuously improve and reevaluate the purchasing activities of the company. <clears throat> and um, I'll give you one good example. Uh, I was, I went to a, an event at Disney and it was actually, we had the uh, person in charge of procurement for all of um, uh, Disney World uh, there in Florida. And he gave a talk and I grabbed him afterwards and we had a long discussion on it. And he said, honestly, he said, what we found was we got a couple of very savvy folks who reviewed the contracts and as they were in the contracts that they made, subcontracts that they were making for equipment, for um, short term type things where they had to bring in um, something for an event or something like that. And uh, the biggest thing was uh, heavy equipment uh, to move things. And he said what we found when we first when he first started doing this was that nobody was watching anything. And he said of all the strategic sourcing plans and you can go and you can get a, um, you know, uh, some sort of a consultant that can charge you a bunch of money and give you a real fancy plan. But he said, in all honesty, the most important thing you can have is one or two people who are continuously looking at all those small contracts, not just looking to make sure they've still got the equipment okay, but to actually look at what is it costing us? Is it being used, et cetera, et cetera. And from that, what I'm really saying is you don't have to have some official strategic sourcing plan, but what you do have to have is a way that you'll continuously evaluate purchasing activities in that. And I would have it not as a, it doesn't have to be a manager, but it has to have a key person and discuss that. Um, and it's a very short discussion. Um, in your proposal, that really will hit home, especially with the um, contracting officer. So that one comes up a lot. And if you see it in the RFP, um, the best way to do it is to, um, instead, of, instead of looking for something fancy or fancy words, and, and, and that, gets, you know, that, that gets me to, a lot of times people bring in consultants. And they come up with a lot of fancy terminology and then we'd read it and say, what are they actually talking about? You want to hit it, hit the nail on the head and say, to maintain our costs, this is how we plan to continuously evaluate um, our purchasing. And we've got a person who's going to do it. That plays really well with a board. Uh, Accuracy of 533s, um, we had problems consistently with small businesses um, on how they were doing their 533s. And the 533s is that document that you send in that says, here is how we spent our money. And everybody has a different way of doing it. And what would happen is, the 530 things would be done wrong on a regular basis, and I couldn't even believe it, but they got hit in their award fee routinely because they didn't have a budget person who understood budget. And they also didn't have a person who would work with the contracting officer to do the 533s or whatever number that, you know, wherever you're working. We call them 533s. Um, they wouldn't work with the CO to do it exactly the way they wanted it done. And it wasn't the CO that was really deciding this. It was the financial side of the house had to have 533s a certain way. So the best way to do that is say, we've got a key person, you know, we will make it part of our management team or it's a, you know, under a manager, but it's a key person for our contract um, to do the 533s and work with the CO simple two or three sentences, 
but we hardly ever saw it with small businesses and we ran into all kinds of problems. And they really hated the 533s not being right. Okay. Contract management. Um, how do we ensure we get the same type of good managers on the next contract? Uh, what can be put in, in on the contract to ensure that they hire and keep good managers, et cetera, et cetera? Um, They'll always ask this on a contract. Now, now on a, on a really small contract, no, they're not going to be doing it. But if it's a, any kind of service type contract, they're definitely going to ask. And you want to um, be right up front with them, how you're going to pay them, where they're coming from, what their background is, which we'll talk in a minute. And you you really want to be upfront how you're going to uh, keep these people. Um, the other thing is to just come right out and say, hey, whether you require this or not, um, we will be, you know, we will be getting with the contracting officer um, on any um, key personnel hires or um, as in the case of the budget person, any of those kind of hires you stay in touch with that CO. Um, it seems like a small thing, but all too often they would switch managers and the manager really wasn't qualified and it became a real headache. So in the proposals, you wanna be right up front. How are you gonna keep the person? How are you gonna work with the person? And how are they gonna work with their staff? Um, they always wanna know that, they hardly ever ask. But when somebody, when a company would come up and say, here's how we deal with it. And in a couple of the orals uh, that we did, uh, where you meet, you meet with them uh, just prior to award. In the orals, uh, the ones that came up and had specific things they did, um, that impressed us. And there's a lot of weight that goes into um, orals. Uh, This one is, is one that I'll just kind of explain it. Some people work with it. Some people probably don't work with it that much. Misuse of base task orders. What that means is if you had, let's say you had five major areas or projects that you're doing, but at the same time, you've got a base staff that handles all the day-to-day um, -day operations, um, whether they're technical or whether they're business. And what happens is a couple of those tasks finish. They finish early um, and now you've got people on staff and instead of going to the CEO and saying, hey, um, we know we've got a lag of two to three months before this next project kicks in. Um, we've got these folks, we obviously wanna keep them. Is there work that you can give them? Is there, or do you want us to just put it on the base task orders? And if you go to the, the, the uh, contracting officer and they may bring in other people uh, to talk about it, if you bring it up to them, then when you run into a problem on your base task order because you had to put these other folks in, they already said it was okay, um, you won't get hit um, and you won't irritate the contracting officer. Because the last thing they like to see is at the end of the month where you dump 15 people, and that's happened. Dump 15 people on the base task order and you're running over. So what I would do is to be upfront, somehow communicate that, and, and the proposal is the best way to do it, and say, here's how we will work um, with projects that end early and we have a lag time between projects and we will get with the contracting officer and decide is there additional work we could get on early or is there you know do you want us to just put it on the base task orders believe it or not that is probably one of the biggest um, um, complaints uh, that i get from both the, the uh, uh, got from the technical people and the contracting officers
area of concern. Um, area of concern, and, and a lot of times on contracts, I've seen them taken off. I've seen them never even put them on there. But if you have a chance to talk with uh, the board, um, talk about seeing if overall uh, or an area of concern or emphasis can be put on the contract. All that means is that if prior to the end of a quarter, when they're going to be when you're going to be evaluated, um, and I did this, I did this a lot, and it worked great. Um, what you do is, uh, if it's on there, the uh, CO uh, usually it was run through the CO. Um, they'll just put on there, hey, we are noticing that costs have been escalating in a certain area, or the quality of the work really hasn't been as good as it used to be, or it's just bad. Um, what they would do is they would write it up as an area of concern. And that always gave the contractor, that'd be you, um, a month or six weeks to fix it. And to be honest with you, it was always fixed within a week because it was never a big deal. It was never, you know, a real headache or a real issue but it definitely was something that would be flagged um, at the end of the quarter when you're being evaluated. So you can make the suggestion, um, and if there's a way to make that suggestion and get it in there, um, it, it really helps you when it comes evaluation time. And I don't even know why they took it out. I, I, I was actually on a I uh, had a contract. I was a monitor for a, a contract and they took it out halfway through and I went and asked why. They said, oh, well, we don't see any use for it. Yet all the people I was working with loved it because they got a heads up and it didn't end up on their evaluation. So not sure how you worked that one um, other than making suggestions uh, to the board uh, at orals or, or various other ways. Um, but that's another one. Um, metrics, and there's a lot on here. I'm only going to go over a little bit of it. Um, be very, um, when they put, this is the biggest problem that I, I've, I've seen on the three boards I was on because we always had to have, it was always metric based. So we always had to have metrics. And most of the technical people on these boards and the COs absolutely do not know how to do metrics. Um, they make up things. They, they make you keep metrics that really have nothing to do with the critical areas that really need to be monitored. Um, for poorly designed metrics, program managers and the folks who are actually keeping the data have to spend unbelievable amounts of resources, literally, to do that. Um, so I, in flipping this around, I'm not quite sure exactly how you do it. I do know that um, one of the ways I would approach it is to when you're having uh, discussions prior to the, you know, when they're first setting up the um, uh, procurement, you generally get a chance to go talk to the contracting officer at least. And one of the questions that you ask are what are the, what are the major problems that you've, you'd like to fix on this next contract? And what are the um, critical areas that you might be doing metrics on and just kind of do a preemptive strike there. Um, because this one um, is, is a real, um, it's a big deal. Um, if you notice in a lot of these and the way this thing was written, it's as if I was talking to a new board and I gave this to about three boards. They were about the only ones that wanted to see it. Um, but if you see how they're written, um, some of these go, don't ask your contractor to develop metrics. You just, you know, uh, you decide which ones you like. It's especially difficult for the contractor to imagine what is important to you. Um, I have seen this where they actually wanted the contractor to come up with the metrics. If they did that, 
I would go back and say, what is critical and get buy in on the critical and then make sure that the metrics are done at a fairly high level. But metrics are really difficult to do. And um, I've seen actually I've seen uh, contracting officers who said there will be no metrics on this uh, board because they were so bad and they were getting so many complaints. Uh, technique to get prime contractors to work together effectively. And that can be a small business, or it can be a large business, it can be them working with each other or whatever. Um, the way that, that contracting officers will do this is with an ACA or an acquisition contract agreement. And in doing that, uh, the most effective thing I saw happen was they had both um, contractors sit down and put the agreement together themselves. And you could be a small, a real small uh, a business, and you could actually be working with a fairly large business. Um, if it comes up, um, what you want to do is say, would it be okay for us, you know, the two prime contractors to get together and work on it. And don't be bashful on that, because if they throw it to a technical person, you have no clue what's going to come out of it, and everybody will be complaining. And, the, and if you're working with a large prime, dollars to donuts, they know the problem, and they will probably want to work with you. So always be willing to work with the, you know, the prime contractor, and don't be bashful to say, hey, could we, you know, you can give us some instructions, but let us uh, sit down and work it out. It's the most effective, it's the most effective way to uh, make it work. And that's what I told the three, the three uh, boards. And they actually did it. Um, uh, just a couple of quick ones on the end. Well, I'll try to end this pretty quickly and see if there's any questions. Missing skills on contracts, um, uh, that happens a lot. And on IT contracts, it happens a whole lot where somebody leaves and now they've got a, um, they've got a real you know, skill that's missing. Um, the way that I would do this on a proposal is uh, even, if it doesn't, even if it's not in um, you know, on the RFP, um, you would talk to them about looking at temporary appointments and tell them how you would do it. We're in contact with, you know, if, if, if uh, we're in contact with other companies that can provide this type of temporary help on a, you know, on a, a part-time basis until, you know, we can fill that, be upfront and tell them how you'll fill those temporary appointments. And you don't have to be that specific. But you can say, um, we are always uh, looking for, you know, temporaries that can be brought in or temporaries that can be brought in and then we steal them from the other company. Um, that happens too. So case in point, just be upfront in the proposal talking about these things that are a concern to the board um, that you've already thought about. And Every time we had a really smart, and we had some really smart companies come and talk, you know, come and uh, uh, propose, uh, they, if they didn't talk about all of these, they talked about most of them, and they had the right people there. So they were able to, you know, be out in front. Uh, key personnel positions. Um, I think I already talked enough about that. Uh, they hate bait and switch where you propose one person and then a contract start, you flip them out. Um, you better have a really good reason um, or it's not off to a, it's usually not off to a good start. Um, having key personnel in areas of high risk, we already talked about that. Even if they don't identify them as a key personnel, talk about them as if you're treating them as a key personnel because we, we believe that's a high risk area. Um, And that's it. A little bit on some of the trends we saw, but that that's really stuff that it's better discussed with the uh, 
um, you know, the boards were more, uh, felt that was more important. Um, any questions? Everybody still with me or? I know it was a lot of information. Any questions? Ann, I see you're at the top. Do you have a question? I don't. That was really interesting. And what came through throughout was that being forthright, um, you know, thinking ahead and being forthright with how you would deal with things and putting that in a very succinct statement that just made perfect sense. Okay, thanks. Yeah, one other thing that that I used to tell folks, uh, and I learned this on the last, well, the second last one, I guess. Um, they they talked about, well, how do you write this thing? And you know, because we've got a they would. I saw a company that actually came in last uh, that spent a hundred thousand dollars on having a professional write their section, and the technical people, when they read your proposal, they know whether you've done it or not. Okay. When you get a pro, when you get a professional in, they're a professional writer most of the time, and they've never really done it. Or if they did it, it was you know a long, long, long time ago. And the technical nothing makes the technical people more unhappy than when they read it and they go, "This person never did this." And I said, so I told them. They said, "Well, you know, we want it to be polished." I said, "Well, having an editor look at it makes sense." But don't have them write it. Um, if you've got a section, get the person who did that section, who can do it. And even if it's somebody that you'll bring in, you know, from outside the company, uh, and that happens all the time, um, uh, that has done that work, have them write it. Because even if it isn't perfect, the technical people, um, they'll write it off. Um, if they look at it and they go, nobody ever did this. I mean, all they're saying is, all they're doing is, and this is the worst one, regurgitating back what we told them to do in the RFP. And it happens all the time. And on big contracts, there's always sections where that seems to happen. But have the person who has done the work. And the one thing I told them was, which really impressed the technical people, um, that I had, because I honestly, when I took that one over, um, I didn't know anything about the contract or any of the technical stuff that was being done or anything. So I was more of a kind of a manager tossed in there. And uh, and so the one thing that really impressed them more than anything was if there was a section that they had done and they go, you know, this here's how we handle this. Here's how we handle this. Near the end, they would say, um, uh, typically, um, there's a problem with this aspect of this and always seems to be something we have to deal with. You don't quite say it that way. And you say it's this. It always seems to, you know, be the tricky part of a, a project. Here is clearly how we handle this problem. And now you got the technical people on your side. They're going to put a big old plus on that. And they're going to go. That's that's exactly how to write those. And have your editor go in and make sure you got the commas right, because the engineers are notorious for run-on sentences and everything. And and sure, you're going to have an editor do it, but you want the person who did it, because even if it isn't the best language or you didn't have an editor do it, a technical person couldn't care less. In fact. In fact, there was one comment that probably the most critical technical person we had on there. He said, you know, he said, I, I know that this, this person has done it. He, he goes, he, he really knows his stuff. I would not approach it this way, but um, I, only because I would do it a different way. But he's absolutely OK doing it that way. That's the highest praise you can have. Make sure the person has actually done it. And if there's any critical things, identify them and talk about how you would handle it. You can't do it any better than that. 
you can you can lose uh you know you can lose a bid fairly easily these days because you got so many people doing it but you will not lose it on technical so anyway that's 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 my spiel so anyone else have any other comments Um, earlier in your PowerPoint, you were talking about the, the kind of continuous process of improvement by having people who were more on the front lines identify things that would improve the process. And um, that reminded me of something that's a common practice in um, industrial animal agriculture. It's called um, HACCP. And it's a uh, hazard analysis critical control point mm -hmm. and al also used in food manufacturing. And as you pointed out, it really is good for morale because you're asking those people who are on the front line to always be looking for better ways and send that up. And so it's just, I think as I read about it, I, that's a really great practice. And it does empower those people on the front line of things. Yeah, yeah, and it, and and especially if you can reward them, if you can reward them, and um, they're they're going to fight for it um, to do it. A uh, hundred years ago, was it 1977? I was a production manager in a, an amateur finishing lab in uh, Iowa. I guess 1980, and um, we were having problems with uh, the film being damaged, uh, paper being damaged, which costs a lot of money, et cetera, et cetera. And so I, I said, okay, I will take the entire department, uh, the film department, and I think there were 18 people in it. I'll take the whole department out, um, and it was to a bar. <laughs> it was pizza and, a, pizza and beer. And if you can solve this problem, um, I will take you all out for this. It took one week to identify where the problem was from the folks. I didn't do a thing. And they put new processes in place, which were simple. And I took the whole group out. And the only bad thing was when I brought, uh, I, I had the uh, uh, plant manager's credit card, his, you know, his, the, the company credit card. And he said, he said, how in the world can you drink this much beer and eat this much beer? <laughs> so, uh, but he said, oh, okay, well, you fixed the problem, so I don't care. I don't remember what the bill was, but it was really high. But I said, I don't care how much. I, I don't care. They fixed my problem. But, um, yeah, clearly getting it to the folks and having a reward system in there, um, it solves problems that will never get, you know, never would be solved again. So not any other way so well is there anybody else everybody else is there silent hey rick yeah yeah my name is eric schmidt um thanks for the talk today it's got me thinking about new ways of approaching nasa um i also i just wanted to chime in because a while back bill carey sent an introduction to you with me on the email and I was wondering if you might check your junk mail to see if it might have gone to junk because it had an image on it. Oh, it could uh, tell you what, could you just resend it to me? I will. I'll resend it after the call. Thank you. Yeah, just send it out to I, I apologize. Uh, I, I do miss stuff. Um, stuff comes in and I, I can't even keep up with it, to be honest with you. So, yeah, just go ahead and, and send it out. A and I will tell you, um, I ran this by uh, a couple of DOD. Um, COs, and they they absolutely agree. They have exactly the same problem. These are very sy systemic. Rick, could you put your email address in the chat? Yeah, yeah, sure. Just to make sure that um, we've all got it. Yeah. Chat. Out there in the mall. Uh, screen sharing. Oh, I got to stop. I'll yeah, stop, stop your screen sharing here. Okay. 
You can't do it with it. I yeah, just if anybody email, else has any they had questions. Both of the emails, oh. This way they just, they've got the, the correct one. I would just concur with what you were saying here, Rick, about, you know, people people under you solving problems. You know, I, I've seen in my business, especially when you when you sit down and you have a meeting, you say, hey, we're having a problem. You're not screaming and yelling. You say, hey, we got to fix this somehow. You're not pointing fingers. You may have a suspicion where the problem is, but you know, to let them yeah. come up with a way to get around it and reward them for it instead of instead of just screaming and yelling and sending emails saying somebody's not doing their job or whatever. Um, yeah, I've seen both techniques too, so. One I'm works sure better than the it. other. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it definitely. Uh, Eastman Kodak had the best suggestion plan it saved something like back in the 70s, it was like 80 or 100 million dollars a year they would save on their suggestion plan. And anyone could put it in, even if they didn't accept it. Um, they sent you like $25 just for, just for putting one in. But there were people who would get on to new projects. And, and I remember that. I was just there for a few months before I went off to college. And there were people who would fight to get on new projects because there were always things that could be done better. And yeah. they were, they would be there firing off mm. suggestions and, um, and, and literally uh, they were making back then hundreds of dollars, you know, was a big deal. And, um, and so they were putting them in all the time. And there were, there was one guy who, I think he got something like $100,000 uh, for his improvement because of the cost savings that came out of it. I mean, most people get a couple hundred dollars or whatever, but uh, yeah. it was very effective. But, you know, $80 million is what they were saving a year uh, with their suggestion program. And it was with, uh, I think they had 400,000 people at that point in time. So, yeah. but listening, listening to the, Listening to the employees is like sometimes the hardest thing because you're all wrapped up, uh, but it's the most effective thing. Thanks, Bill. Yeah. I would I would also just, you know, even in writing proposals and do a lot of brainstorming as a team and then honing it down so that people own that proposal. And in their, you know, yeah. I think that idea of having them write those sections um, or at least have heavy input. A lot of people don't want to write their own proposals because they're intimidated. But if you hire somebody to do your own your proposal, the next time you do a proposal, you have to hire somebody again and again and again because you haven't really yeah. learned how to do it. Right. I think it's more effective to in the long run to learn how to do it yourself, and then you know what was actually promised. Yeah. That's a concept, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah, because once they sign that contract, that you know your proposal's in that contract. So yeah, um, yeah, we had uh, uh, we had oh, what was it? Uh, we had one guy who uh, came up to me and he he said, "Hey, I'm uh, I'd like to start subcontracting with these types of companies." And he had a pretty good product, so he was you know he was going to be able to do it. And, and I told him, I said. This is the advice that I got from someone. It wasn't my idea. He said, when you go to talk to them, tell them that you're willing to help write, write the proposal. In fact, if if for some reason in orals they want you, you want, you know, they wanted to have you there to talk it, you will come. I said, volunteer to help write it. They'll help you with it. I mean, they'll they'll tell you what to write and everything. Uh, you just have to put the content in. But Mm -hmm. I was talking to a couple of other when I had I was rep to the small business council and I happened to mention that story and there were two or three of them that said you're absolutely right if if you just say hey you know tell me when you know tell me what you want me to do uh, but you're not willing to put some skin in the game they're going to take the person who's got the skin in the game even if they aren't quite you mm -hmm. know quite as good as you know the next person who doesn't want to help. I think going, maybe everybody's here has experienced this, um, but I remember 
when I was trying to get one of my first letters of support and somebody had told me, offer to write the draft. And I'm like, well, that seems really wrong and self-serving, but it's really not because if you're asking somebody to help you and then you're helping them help you. Um, so then I would go through and I would literally, I wouldn't copy word for word, but I would pull some of the, the concepts off of their, a lot of times off of their web page or their credentials, you know, in the first paragraph. And then the second paragraph, I would make it say what I wanted to say, hey, you know, this is why we care about this because we're working in these areas. This technology is important for us to track. And, and if they, yeah. if it, comes out if it turns into something significant we want to we would consider being in on it mm -hmm. but a lot of times when you write a draft like that if you really put the time into it you'll get that draft with a couple of word changes maybe a few mm -hmm. corrections on their letterhead with the signature and it's like wow this looks like exactly what i wrote almost word <laughs> for word Denise so. Navarro, who's who's spoken at our thing, I think last year she spoke at one of them, and uh, she told me she said I've got canned stuff that we've written, and I can piece things together and then modify the language, you know, to, yeah. to make it closer to it. But she said I've got canned stuff that we've written for all our proposals, and she's done really well. She does mostly subcontracting, but she said. Um, that's how I do it. <laughs> yeah. So absolutely right. Anybody else? Alan, you haven't said anything. I see you're there. Maybe he may have had to step away. I'm not sure. Oh, okay. Well, that's probably why he's got the his uh, picture on. <laughs> normally he would have his camera on so he probably had to take a phone call or something yeah so. yeah that's it well anyway well okay, okay. well it's it's the one o'clock so uh thanks for coming i hope it was hope it was useful and just as a reminder we all email this out probably the first of next week the the powerpoint to all of those all of you that attended um and our next lunch and learn um, remember, second and fourth Friday of each month will be March 11th. At this okay. point, unless we find that we need to do something okay. sooner. But right now, plan on the 11th. Did you talk okay. about the possibilities of what we might be doing? Vic no, no, we didn't. Um, we, we just said that we're going to start with um, the second and fourth um friday of every month for the lunch and learns and our goal is to have an email notification out to you all the week before of what the topic will be so that um you will have some information and we'll know you know is that something i want to or feel like i really need to sit in on or 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 not just as a teaser we're, yeah. we're working on bringing in a couple of the tech scouts onto that next lunch and learn if if it works into their schedule they they want to do it but they're they're you know, have to map it into their schedule and it, it probably will be either that or else or i'll be talking about uh sbirs and innovation in general and specifically what types of topics actually make a good sbir and what doesn't really fit into the program real well hmm. from my non-expert but experienced opinion um, so that's two possibilities that are going to be coming up in two, in a couple of weeks. So just letting you know. All right. Okay. All righty. Okay. Well, thanks for everybody. Anything Good else? Good to see everyone.